Hello, I'm Jonathan Dimmelby. Thanks for taking the time to download this edition of Any Questions from BBC Radio 4. Welcome to Althorpe, the family seat of the Spencer family. We are not in the big house, however, but in a big tent as the guests of the Althorpe Literary Festival, which is packed with literary lions and lionesses. And our panel here, Nigel Evans, Conservative MP, who was a Deputy Speaker of the House of Commons until he stood down when he was charged with a number of sex offences, including rape. Two months ago, he was found not guilty on all counts. He likened his experience up to that moment to being run over by an Eddie Stobart truck. You look as though you've picked yourself up and dusted yourself down pretty well. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting there, which is what I say when people ask me how I am. I'm getting there. Mm. And ready for this bear pit. Absolutely. George Galloway, MP, is MP for the Respect Party, which he founded. But he's ambivalent about serving his constituents at Westminster. He says that he finds 2% of the job terrifying, 98% tedium. Perhaps it's some consolation he has many other outlets for his energies. <laughs> Amongst others, commentator for the English-language television channel that's owned by the Iranian government called Press TV, which many people in this country watch. Rishanara Ali was born in Bangladesh, but grew up in the London borough of Tower Hamlets, where her father was a manual labour. Labourer. She went to Oxford University and four years ago became the first person of Bangladeshi origin to become an MP, winning back for Labour an East London seat previously occupied by respect in the person of George Galloway, though he by that time has stood down in that contest in favour of another Bengali who lost. Rushanara Al- Rushanara Ali is now Shadow Education Minister. Charles Moores edited The Spectator and both The Sunday and Daily Telegraphs, and he remains prolific in those pages as a columnist. The first volume of his authorised biography of Margaret Thatcher has won acclaim from across the political spectrum and been hailed as one of the great biographies of our time. He's the fourth member of our panel. And we'll go to our first question, please. Helen Jones. Is there ever a case when a stable dictator is more beneficial than a weak democracy? Iraq appears to be in the throes of falling apart, um, and everyone is pleading for some alternative to what otherwise might be the outcome. Uh, Charles Moore. Well... I don't really think that dictators normally are stable. You see, they appear stable um, because they k- kill and repress so many people who are against them. But it, that, that in itself produces underlying instability. And Saddam Hussein, if we're thinking particularly about him, um, first of all, uh, sacrificed huge numbers of his fellow countrymen in an unnecessary war. He also killed uh, qu- a great many of his own people by uh, attacks and by repression. Uh, and he built up an enormous uh, amount of hatred, uh, which made his country unstable. He then invaded Kuwait, um, uh, which threatened the order of the whole region. And so actually, this idea that this um, you know, nasty but strong man is somehow holding the thing together uh, is, is a misrepresentation. I think people romanticise dictators in that, that way. They sort of say, OK, um, he's nasty, but he can do the business. It's not really right. It just stores up the trouble, and we're seeing all the trouble now. Is Iraq better off now than it was uh, before the uh, Western invasion? Well, it's the most dreadful mess, but um, it's be- certainly better off without Saddam. Uh, the, the problem was not, re- was not replacing uh, Saddam with a representative and successful um, uh, government, but that's, that's, a, that's a different order of question, I think. Roshanara Ali. Well... The, the situation uh, at the moment in Iraq is deeply worrying. Uh, and I, you know, as someone who opposed the war in Iraq and the military intervention, um, I, I feel that where we are, where the international community is uh, at the moment, is in a very, very difficult place. But what we need to do is uh, make sure we give um, uh, what is still a democratically elected government today in Iraq, the diplomatic support, humanitarian assistance and other appropriate assistance to try and uh, address what is an incursion that's coming from jihadists, um, what could lead to uh, regional, further regional instability, where the context is you have a conflict in in Syria. uh, That requires... Uh, working with the regional powers. Uh, You know, this is not something that Western societies uh, 
should and can uh, just um, uh, feel that they should be sorting out. That's where historically we've had problems, where Western governments have felt that um, and behave like they can go in and sort out the problems of other regions, particularly in the Middle East. Impl- implicit in that is that however uh, much of a, of a monster Saddam was, Iraq would have been better under Saddam than now, you, you oppose the war, than, than, than now. I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that, of course, you want, you want stability and democracy. Uh, and it takes a very, very, it takes hundreds of years, as we found in our own country here, to build a mature democracy. And sometimes uh, there is a sense that when countries come out of conflict, that, um, you know, democracy can thrive and you can have stability very quickly. And I think there's an impatience in, in, particularly in the West, that these countries should be able to just pick themselves up and be stable and be democratic. And, and if they're not, then you know, uh, we want to, you know, we become impatient. So okay. I think recognising the history, recognising the context and how, how hard it is and societies and the international community need to support these countries that come out of conflict to be able to rebuild and reconstruct and, and become mature democracies takes a long time. Is there ever a case uh, when a stable dictator is more beneficial than a weak democracy? George Galloway. No, it's a false dichotomy. The uh, alternative to a dictatorship ought to be a proper and strong and stable democracy. The fact that we don't have one in Iraq is a direct result of the foreign invasion and occupation of the country, the deliberate sectarianization of the American governor, uh, Paul Bremer, uh, when he entered and became the plenipotentiary of the United States in Iraq and set about deliberately sectarianizing, dividing the people, the better to rule them. Uh, But uh, we did tell you all this would happen, uh, Jonathan. Millions of us, Rushanara and me, and millions of us on the streets of this country, we did tell you all this would happen. And we were were rubbish. Well, I know you want to talk about now, but you can only understand now if you understand what went wrong then appreciate and appreciate were... that, but give, given that, and given that we we can't have a whole seminar, which would be extremely interesting, I have no doubt, and mm. important. Um, no. Uh, can, can can you? you there is I, this predicament now. You've got ISIS mm. yes. expanding its territory mm. with its uh, mm. uh, search for a, 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 an Islamic state of extreme conservatism, to put it in its mildest, and prepared to use extreme methods to achieve it mm. in the region as well as in uh, Iraq itself. What mm. would, what should one do now? Well, however extreme their methods, they won't be as extreme as the methods used by George Bush and Tony Blair. And that's uh, all I'm asking for is not a seminar, but a little humility from those who rubbished those who said all this would happen. Because one's pronouncements now uh, will be judged, or ought to be, on the, uh, through the lens of what the previous pronouncements were and how right or wrong they were. We have a real problem with this fanatic group, ISIS, because we're supporting it in Syria next door, but contemplating bombing it in Iraq. That's a contradiction that even the British media will not for long be able to disguise. And the British media has played a significant role in encouraging the war in Syria, which is now spilled over into Iraq. The answer in Iraq is a proper, real, national unity government, straddling all the sectarian uh, divides, all the political divides, a legalization and, uh, and, and uh, with uh, release of prisoners and so on, that is required to have a real national rally. OK, thank you. Nigel Evans. I'm um, going to agree with George in his conclusion, which is that what we need now is a government of national unity. I mean, part of the problem with the weak democracy uh, is that uh, Maliki has uh, shunned the Sunni uh, section and the Kurdish section, uh, and that has caused a lot of the discontent whereby they're now looking uh, for salvation from uh, a group that is even more worse, if that's at all possible, than al-Qaeda. 
But I listened very carefully to what George said, and I can only come to the conclusion that in response, in a direct response to the answer from Helen, is that he would prefer Saddam Hussein still in power uh, versus the change that's currently happened. And um, I, 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 I'm absolutely delighted that Saddam Hussein and his henchmen are no longer there. Yes, uh, it is a mess now, but my goodness me, it was a mess then. And the uh, answering the question directly, uh, under the so-called stable dictator, the people of Iraq lived in fear. Now, under the weak democracy, the people of Iraq live in fear. What about the people in this country in the West? Are, are, are we... Are they more at risk now uh, as a result of what has happened than they were? Uh, a great many analysts believe that to be the case, that, that the creation of jihadism flows, stems directly from 2003. Well, well the one experience uh, that um, has taught me many things recently has been that you can't press the, uh, the rewind button on things that have happened. You've only got to learn from the past and make progress. And therefore, um, I would say, Jonathan, that uh, the fact is, um, I believe that the implications of what's going on in Iraq at the moment are hugely serious for us here in the United Kingdom, hugely serious for us in the West. And we can't just sit idly by. We have to come to some conclusions as to what to do. And number one has certainly got to be humanitarian aid for the populations there that are going to be badly affected by what's happening on the ground in Iraq. But at the same time, uh, if you're asking me, would I now want to be putting troops into Iraq? The answer is no. We've got to learn the lessons of the past. Uh, Charles Moore. Well, George was calling for a government of national unity in Iraq, but I do love watching the famous video, I do recommend it, of George um, speaking to Saddam Hussein. And he said, uh, Sir, uh, I salute your courage, your strength and your indefatigability. Um, and, uh, uh, um, well, you know, George, George I, I always salute your boldness and your brass and your ingenuity, but I don't think you're a great authority on national unity and how it should be brought about in Iraq. Uh, uh, Charles, last time you lied about me on Iraq, it cost your, it cost your newspaper £2.3 million. So <laughs> I, I suggest a little humility from you uh, also. I wasn't going to bring it up, but as you gave me such a beautiful open uh, goal... I and the World Cup is underway. Uh, I couldn't uh, resist striking the ball into that empty uh, just, net. Just as, as a matter of fact, as, 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 as I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer. Just, just, just as a matter of fact, because it's rather important given this is a live broadcast, um, did you say those words or I not? I didn't say them about Saddam Hussein. I've explained that a thousand times, but Charles, well, uh, affects, the video. Charles <laughs> affects not to understand it. But the judge understood it uh, very well, uh, to a very great cost to his then... Employer. He was the editor then, he's not the editor now. Th these two facts may be uh, connected, or may not. <laughs> the, uh, the, although he was fox hunting when the paper went to bed. OK, and OK, I'm, OK, I'm, let's I'm, move on. I'm, I'm not making that up. Yeah. Well, uh, you say let's move on. I think it's important to do so, and for me to deal with Nigel's <laughs> calumny, that somehow what I said in answer to Helen's question was that I would prefer Saddam Hussein still to be there. When you replay that on the, uh, 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 the replay button, you'll find that I said no such thing. What I argued for in my first answer was the end to the encouragement of sectarianism in the Arab world. Iraq has been utterly ruined by it. Syria is being utterly ruined by it. And it is the declared policy of the Western governments that are supported by Nigel and by Charles. And that's how we got here. It's vital for people to know that. OK, I must pause you there. I must let Charles back in once more, but only very briefly and not back to the uh, last argument. I'm just delighted that uh, George said I was fox hunting because uh, I wasn't, and so at last I can sue him. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Open season, um, as it were, <laughs> uh, between you. But mercifully... Nothing has been said on air which could be construed as defamatory <laughs> to an extent that either of you are going to suffer too much, I trust. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not getting any nods from either of them, but anyway, we'll leave it there. Um, We're we, consulting we, our lawyers. We, we, we'll, go, we'll go to our next question. Mike Tebbit, what is meant by the term British values? British values, much in vogue in political debate at the moment. The Prime Minister essayed 
I would say freedom, tolerance, respect for the rule of law, belief in personal and social responsibility, and respect for British institutions. British values, if you can say there's anything meant by them, what do you think is meant by them? Um, Rishanara. Well, I, I don't think they, the points that David Cameron's made are distinctly British values, but I, what I would say, I'd bring it to the personal. I'm really proud to be... Uh, British, to be Muslim, to be Bangladeshi, to be an East Ender as well. We all have multiple identities. And I think one of the best things about this country is that we don't uh, impose identities on people. We don't force people to assimilate and let go of their faith or cultural background. But that requires all of us to work together to ha to find the things that we agree on and we share, those values that we share, and I share the values of, with many others in society, of respect for the law, respect for the rule, uh, democracy, um, and equality uh, of treatment. And what's really important is in these debates that uh, politicians have, uh, at, uh, that have been having at the moment, that we focus on the things that unite us, and that across society we... Uh, avoid uh, pulling apart and I think the debates around extremism and the some of the language in the media recently whether it's the spectator front page which I, which I found Shameful. disgraceful um, uh, What did you find the, disgraceful about the Well the use page? of a child holding the Quran and a sword and the title was uh, taught to hate and I think that it stigmatises children I think that's wrong. When schools are failing, it's a failure of the government, it's a failure of Michael Gove to get a grip and sort it out. Not children, not, not children and not parents. And that's what's happened in this case. We've had the Secretary of State uh, for Education and the Home Secretary arguing about a national security issue and then using appalling language, disgraceful language, like draining the swamp. That is wrong. And we, as a society, need to all work Work together so that the preachers of hate, and there are some, sadly, but they're a minority, are not the ones that uh, are used to define an entire community, and but in this case not, it's the Muslim community. But there is, not, there is not anything that could be in any way described as a swamp? Well, I think that kind of language in, 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 poli in political discourse is deeply, deeply dangerous. I think when, you, you know, I have constituents from all backgrounds uh, and young people, children, you know, as a, uh, when I was growing up uh, in, and going to school, if I, you know, as a Muslim child in a majority Muslim school that was state secular, uh, that was my experience, um, uh, if I heard that kind of language, I would have felt really, really saddened that our politicians could speak in that way. What's really important is that they go after those people who are... So have Having undue influence in the education system, uh, whatever their agenda, and that children are protected, and that we make sure that they are safeguarded at the moment because of the government's centralising agenda, and okay. there's no local local accountability. Parents don't this. have anywhere to go when you, there's a problem. You, you, we don't. Panelists, just to remind you, do not have any foreknowledge of the question, so I'm just. We, we may just be going into that territory, which will allow you to explore it a bit more. Um, a former Spectator editor, contributor to The Spectator, Charles Moore. Well, I agree very much with the first thing that Rishanara said about language. It is, very, it is important what words you choose, uh, and you can cause quite unnecessary offence. Um, but I don't agree with her the way I think her conclusions are going, because I do think that what is happening is that there is uh, what in the Cold War was called subversion, and which we don't uh, pay attention to enough, uh, working through... Um, under the cover of uh, Islam and people who are... Uh, it's actually a worse problem for Muslims than for all the rest of us, and good knows it, goodness knows it's bad for the rest of us, um, because that religion is constantly being misrepresented by some of its own adherents. And uh, that is a really serious problem when that gets into the school system. And what we're talking about here is, is a subversion, because this hasn't been done... They haven't said, right, let's have a school which teaches these things. These are state schools. They're not, they're not uh, religious just, schools. Just, 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 just go back to the, to, to the question. I'm not going to stop you explaining yeah. that. But the, the, do you have a, can you give meaning to the concept of British values, which gives it a unique character? Well, I don't like it much because 
partly I don't like hearing it from politicians who I don't really think are experts on this subject. Um, uh, but um, I think what we do have is a history. You know, we, and we're very lucky, actually, to have a very uh, great and long history. And we can learn a lot from our history. And out of that do uh, come certain qualities, um, uh, uh, such as tolerance. And if we are going to understand what we do about new communities and threats uh, within new communities and threats to all of us, we have to understand that history very well. We, we, had a, one, we had a lot of questions on this, and one of them was, I, I, I remember, should we be tolerant of the intolerant? Philip Astor put that question. Should we be tolerant of intolerance? No. Um, no, no. So tolerance uh, only goes so far? Uh, well, people can be intolerant in the sense they can say frightful things. I'm sure some of us do on any question sometimes. But if they're actually exercising power... Um, over people to, in an intolerant way, no. And I think it's a terrible thing, actually, to think that our second greatest city in this country has some of its schools have been seriously infiltrated by people who are preaching. They are preaching we will hate, and they're preaching anti-British doctrine. Well, I just want to hold, I want to hold back Muslims. next. We are going to come to yeah. that very right. particular yeah. issue. But and just yeah. let me ask you to, 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 to follow through what um, uh, Roshanara said. Mm. The, 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 the spectator, child of Quran taught to hate with a picture of the Quran and, uh, and holding a sword. What do you, is that calculated to...? Well, I certainly don't agree with what Roshanara said, that um, this is somehow insulting or stigmatising the child. It's, it's in, encouraging people to sympathise with the child. The child is caught by what it's being taught. That's surely the message of the picture. OK. Um, uh, George Galloway. I rather agree with Michael Gove, albeit in 2008, when he said that there's something un-British about demanding the inculcation of British values, both for the reason that Rushnara touched on, that the values we're actually talking about are by no means exclusively British, neither have the British always exclusively practised them. Uh, but I agreed with the Prime Minister up until the point he said that we must respect British institutions. What does that mean? I don't respect the British Parliament as currently constituted, at all. When they were filling their pockets with stolen expenses, thanks to the Daily Telegraph exposed, they were thoroughly uh, unworthy uh, of respect. I don't respect the fact that we have an unelected monarchy, an unelected House of Lords. I don't respect the misuse that is made, has been made recently especially, of our armed forces. Now, if we are to be demanded to salute and respect institutions, well, that's not very British because it's not very democratic. Democracy means that a thousand flowers must bloom and some of them will be flowers that we don't particularly like the look or the smell of. Nigel Evans. Um, <clears throat> George, um, George is right when he says that the British democracy has warts, but I have to say that there are a number of countries around the world that would uh, give their eye teeth uh, for the democracy that we have compared to the lack of democracy that they simply um, uh, are experiencing. Um, you can see British values in the definition such as the one that uh, David Cameron gave, or you can define it by what it isn't. And what we know uh, about British values, that it isn't, uh, about intimidation of teachers by the governors uh, who are promoting either uh, hate, uh, 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 hate philosophy uh, or trying to get the youngsters steered away from uh, a basic core education and curriculum. I'm going to have to bring, I'm gonna have to bring, I'm gonna have to bring you our next question because we're on tender, so we're on the, on, the, on, the, on the cusp of going right into it. But, and I want to bring the question in, but just very briefly before that, uh, are, you, are you with, therefore, Mark, Michael Gove Mark II rather than Michael Gove Mark I, as uh, described by George Galloway, well, that it's un-British to inculcate British well, values? What I do know, though, is, and I know that uh, George... Which got, one are you with? It's very no, simple. No, I'll tell you what, I'm with Michael Gove as opposed to those who really have perpetrated uh, the problems that are being experienced by uh, some schools in Birmingham, Fortunately, not the vast majority of schools, I hasten to add, but it's the rot that's within the schools that we've got to remove. Let's put the children first. We will go then swiftly, Elizabeth Hunt, to our next question. Does the recent Trojan Horse Schools revelations highlight the dangers of giving the running of our state schools to private organisations as academies and trust schools? <laughs> OK, 
carry on your starter for two Nigel Evans. <laughs> uh, I, uh, there again, I do not believe that it is simply uh, anything to do uh, with uh, the fact that uh, parents or other groups or organisations wish to see the sorts of schools uh, with more flexibility away from the state control that they're currently was from uh, the local authorities. We've got a multiplicity of sorts of schools in the United Kingdom, and the vast majority of them are delivering excellent education for the vast majority of pupils. What we've got to make absolutely certain is that the uh, inspectorate regime is incredibly rigorous to ensure that what's happened in a small number of schools in the United Kingdom uh, is simply not allowed to happen. Uh, and so I believe that the, um, uh, one, of the, one of the changes that Michael announced is something that I actually thought was already happening, which is that the inspectorate could turn up unannounced and find out what's happening to the education of our youngsters in certain schools. I'm delighted it's going to happen latterly, but the fact is it should have happened years ago. Can I... Uh, uh, Rishanara Ali, can I, can, I, can I ask you, first of all, do, given what you said in, the, in answer to the earlier question, do you accept... At the Ofsted key reports findings in Absol their totality? Absolutely. There, there are clearly serious issues in the six schools that Ofsted identified. But what that case highlights is that the, the fact that Michael Gove has taken away local accountability uh, and not replaced it with any form of local accountability means that when there's a problem, it takes a very long time, as we've seen, four years. Michael Gove was told about this problem four years ago before it gets to the attention of the minister. He's directly trying to manage 22,000 schools in our country. That is a problem. That's why we have called for local school standards commissioners in order to address this vacuum which is causing this problem. And it's a problem not just for Birmingham. There are problems in other areas on financial mismanagement, and that is going to be the next big issue. Yeah. So the accountability issue has to be sorted out. This is where Michael Gove has categorically but, failed. But in, 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 in Birmingham, two of these schools were under local authority direct uh, uh, control. They weren't uh, academies. But the, the bigger danger, actually, I mean, my, no, local, but, but, my but, I mean, bigger you, danger you, is, historically, you've had local accountability. What you've got with this free-for-all is more risk. Um, at the, I'm going back to the question that was asked, is greater risk that the, the lack of oversight at a local level, however you may wish to frame it, is dangerous. So we need to ensure, I'm not saying local authorities are all perfect. There are good local authorities and there's those that have, are, are not doing a good job of uh, oversight. And in this case, the local authority has questions to answer as well as uh, the government. But, but the Would point the is we need you? proper accountability. We need it, parents it, to be able to go to uh, an, an organisation immediately and get urgent preventative action before the problem becomes had they huge. Been, had they been faith schools... Um, and not secular schools, would you have been content with the advocacy, the powerful advocacy of, of ex conservative values in the, in the Muslim schools as, for instance, attitudes towards homosexuality, attitudes as in Catholic Church towards abortion or in some parts of the, of the Christian Look, church? The, the, there is a legal framework which we need to return to. And what's really important is that the, the faith school uh, pr provisions that are provided under legislation require checks and balances. What's happened with other schools, state-funded schools, that um, uh, is, is that you've got, as the inspection reports have highlighted, you've got certain groups trying to exercise undue, inappropriate influence. And so we need to make sure that is sorted out. And that's why uh, we need better local protection and accountability. And that's what's missing at the moment. George Galloway. Well, you know, it was, the, it, it was for a very long time the Tory mantra that we should have all these free schools and parental power and all of that. Now they're complaining about it in some schools. I, I'm, I'm old-fashioned in many ways. And one of them was that I believe that schools should be run by the democratically elected and removable and accountable local authorities. Now, we, anyone can set up a school. I could do so right now. Academies are being given to car dealers and carpet sellers. I'm not making that up. In fact... The, gentle, the gentlemen in those two examples I gave run many academies and they inculcate their values through those schools. I think that's completely wrong. 
everybody in this country, unless they pay to opt out of it, or they pay a part of the cost by setting up a faith school, should be educated according to the same national curriculum, the same values, and the people responsible for running them should be able to be voted out if they're doing a bad job. And that's what we don't have at the moment. A Freudian slip, a good one, from uh, Jonathan, was that we're talking here about conservative values, not extremist values. The way this story has spread, you'd think they'd found weapons in these schools. It wasn't, they excuse me, it was not a Freudian slip, it was a deliberate well, uh, good uh, that attempt you did it to identify a distinction All right. that can be made between conservative yeah. values well, and extreme values. I, I'm glad that you made it, because that is what they found. Now, I, and Charles actually, have many conservative values. Both of us are against abortion. I sent my own daughter to that well-known Al-Qaeda academy, <laughs> Haberdashers Asks, a separate girls' school, because I didn't want her talking to boys during the school day, because I think girls do better in girls' schools. And when you examine some of the criticisms that were made, that the girls had to sit at a separate picnic table or on school trips, the girls were in one carriage and the boys were in another as the father of girls, I want that. I want that. That makes me conservative. It doesn't make me dangerous or extreme or a supporter of uh, Islamist okay. uh, extremism. Lastly, uh, Jonathan, if Briefly. I may, one of the main criticisms was that one of these schools refused to have a tombola because they didn't want to encourage gambling. Well, I'm one of the most anti-gambling people in this country. I don't want my kids learning gambling at school either. I, I just the, 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 the points that you make, just very briefly, do you, do you accept that Ofsted is right to have identified, as it has done, uh, an organised campaign, I quote, to alter character and ethos, and the breakdown of trust between governors and staff and teachers being bullied and intimidated? Do you accept that that no, is likely I, to have I, happened I, or I, not? No, I, I don't. I accept the Ofsted report before that just 11 months before that, in which they had judged these schools to be outstanding. OK. What's changed is the UKIP rocket in the uh, political polls. This is the Tory answer to UKIP. But a dog whistle, no, a dog whistle answer. George, come on. The inspectorate, the, the inspectorate uh, in those days weren't turning up. Uh, unannounced. Now they'll have the opportunities to do so. They didn't talk now, about unannounced. A, now, on now a let, whistleblower let, let. has been uh, uh, has given the evidence forward. There's been an investigation that took three months. It was a you hope. cannot uh, you cannot it's agree. Hold, 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 hold agree it, with some of the antics that were going on in the school, including the intimidation of teachers. Charles Moore. Well, I'm really puzzled now about what George thinks because having attacked schools run by carpet sellers, he then <laughs> sent his daughter to haberdashers. <laughs> What's the? Uh, um, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and actually, it's, very, it's, it's actually quite impo important that, to remember that the great commercial guilds of this country set up some of the very best schools. It's a very big moral contribution. But can we get away... I, 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 can we escape for a moment from this local government versus academy business? Because I think what the real question here about Trojan Horse and all that is about what in banking is called due diligence. That's what yeah. banks are supposed to do when they look into things. And if, as we notoriously know, they did they, as, as, we, as we notoriously know, they didn't. That's but, one of but, the institutions yes. we're supposed to, re, to respect. No, but, but that's because there wasn't proper due diligence in the banks that we have so much trouble. And there's an equivalent in the schools and in the in inspectorate, which has been uh, revealed by all of this. It was a great surprise to me, for example, that often the inspectors uh, are not actually... Um, part of Ofsted, Ofsted commissions groups of people who may have a certain vested interest or who may be particularly close to, in this case, other Muslim colleagues already. Uh, there's a lot of people in one another's pockets in this game. And, um, and uh, I, I really think that's... The, import, the local, national is an important argument, but it's not what this is really about. This is about how people can subvert something and we haven't been attentive and clever enough to prevent it. I, many of you will be hanging with your notepads at the ready to give to get the Any Answers number, which I would have given you earlier if I hadn't been so engaged in what I was listening to. The Any Answers number is 03 700 100 444. <coughs> 
Anita Arnand will be there to take your calls, your emails and your tweets. The email address is any.answers at bbc.co.uk and you can tweet using the hashtag BBCAQ. Could we go to our next, please? Jackie Winnie. Why should those accused of rape receive anonymity where others accused of other crimes do not? Um, I'm going to start, to, with, with, obviously, uh, with you, Nigel Evans, because you've called for that. Uh, what I've called for um, as well is that the Home Affairs Select Committee investigate it because, Jackie, there's always unintended consequences whenever you make any changes to legislation. Uh, the law before 1988 was exactly as uh, you have just said, that there was anonymity, because crimes uh, involving sex are almost seen as a part. <clears throat> um, I'll give the example, for instance, of uh, the young president of the Oxford Student Union. Everybody knows uh, what he has been accused of. He's not been charged of anything. It might well be at the end of the investigation that he's not. His life will never, ever be the same again. Through the prism of some of the um, uh, celebrity uh, accusations, we've known from what Jimmy Tarbuck said. Uh, a year's investigation, uh, no charge brought. He had a, a one year of hell. The same with Jim Davidson, uh, longer than a year. Uh, and for a number of people who are not uh, celebrities, are not well-known names, they will be going through exactly the same. So uh, I would like the Select Committee to look at the whole gamut of things, uh, I would like them to see, um, and I know one of the arguments that said that uh, with um, publicity, it means that other people come forward, and yes, they do. But uh, after a police investigation, if there is sufficient evidence and it is decided that a charge is brought, the publicity will come then. And then if uh, other people come forward, then clearly the police can continue their investigation because the trial doesn't uh, start the week after a charge is brought. All I am saying is that for a number of people, and it's easy to make these accusations, and indeed I've known people who have been in similar positions to myself where it's gone to charge, they've gone through a trial, the trauma of a trial, whether it be Eddie Shaw, where it was 22 months and totally acquitted, his life will never be the same, a friend of mine uh, where the jury took less than half an hour to chuck it out when they saw uh, CCTV footage and they could prove that uh, what he was saying was right and what the lady was saying was wrong. What His about, life will never be the same and my life will never be the same again. What about the case, because it's where others accused of other crimes don't get anonymity. There are other kinds of crimes which aren't sexual offences uh, of which people are acquitted and, and they, and they uh, suffer enormously uh, uh, through the charges laid against them and the court procedures, etc. Why should they not similarly... It seems, it seems to follow from what you're saying that they similarly should have anonymity, no, they're, they're, that, that all the accused should always have anonymity. Well, let, let the Home Affairs Select Committee look into no, the whole arena of these uh, uh, particular things. But what I do know is that there is a special stigma... Uh, almost, well, I can't say almost unique because it's either unique or it isn't. There is a unique stigma attached to the allegations of uh, rape, uh, particularly, and uh, sexual assaults. And uh, I believe, therefore, that when the law was what it was in 1988, it was that there was anonymity till charge. All I'm saying is that I want a committee of uh, people who will look at the Unintended consequences, the pros and the cons, it may well be. And I'll give you one, one, one suggestion, perhaps, which is that normally you would get anonymity unless the police were able to convince a judge that the anonymity was lifted, that there is a specific reason why they believe anonymity should be lifted in a certain case, and then let a judge look at it and a judge consider it. But I think that uh, publicity from the day that the police knock on the door and you go through a year of hell... And then in the end, there is going to be no charge, I just think, is a trauma uh, that people should not face. Krishnara mm. Ali. I, I, can, um, I can't imagine what Nigel will have gone through in his experience. But what, we, what we've got to look at is, ha you know, is to make sure that uh, we strike the right balance and there is consistency in the way the law treats um, those who are accused of a crime. And I think the issue is actually around the media and what is allowed to be covered or not. Uh, so, uh, but, but looking at the issues around rape in particular, which is a highly um, sensitive issue, and women 
often tend not to come forward uh, to uh, the prosecutions uh, uh, that, that are deeply, diff- you know, often very difficult. So this is a very, very complex issue. And I think that if changes are to be made, they have to um, put the victims of rape first and make sure that justice, that, 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 that we have confidence that justice can be done and will be done and that there is consistency across the board. Is, there, is it the case, do you think, that... that celebrities or people in the public eye are much more likely to be given this attention because the media, you touched on it, want, you know, it is a potential scandal, a potential um, major crime that has been uh, committed, that they, uh, that they particularly uh, suffer through this well, rather than people who are not in the public eye and therefore don't get the t- same attention, even though the same charges are laid. Well, well there, there are many high-profile cases of the, where it's, it's celebrities. They are, I agree. And, and I think it's a particular issue for those in the public eye already uh, that this issue becomes much more pronounced. But I, but I would say that this applies to... that There'll be similar issues for other forms of crime as well. Where, uh, there, where there's high-profile uh, individuals I just want to come involved, in on that, which is non-celebrities get damaged as well, um, because local newspapers will promote uh, those particular cases. And in one uh, case where a student was accused again uh, and uh, was uh, acquitted, he had to change his name by deed poll before he finished ex- yes. his exams because he knew that every potential employer Google searches these days people's names and would find out that he'd been yeah. accused of rape. Yeah. Charles Moore. Uh, well, I very much agree with the, the thrust of what Nigel is saying, and I v- particularly agree with the last point, that it's not just about famous people. It's, it seems to me that because of the readiness with which people can be accused uh, anonymously, whole professions are in danger now. I mean, it's a very tough thing to be a teacher now, because you could be accused of paedophilia. It's a very tough thing to be a priest. It's a very tough thing to be anybody, actually, who has to deal with children. Um, and it's a pretty tough thing often to be um, uh, a man uh, working in an environment um, uh, where he has charge of authority over women. That can also be uh, a serious problem. So I do think we need to take that as a very wide issue. And the other point is the point about victims. I think I agree with Roshanara that... Um, if you had to s- decide which is more important, the victim's case is even more important than the accused, though we must always remember the rights of the accused. But we don't know necessarily who is a victim because we mustn't think of rape as this thing, which is a sort of classic thing where the man with a hood jumps out on uh, a woman um, and um, uh, rapes her when it's quite clear that she has been raped. There are often, often complicated cases when the whole question is, has this person been... Has the... Not only did this person do it, but was it done by anybody? And there's a, there are, if, if you're not rigorous about all of that, you will have a whole load of false accusations and, and innocent that's, people I'm going sorry, to prison. That, that's what so, the courts are for. And I, think yes. I, I do take issue with this point that you're making, which is um, victims of rape uh, find it very difficult to come forward... Anyway, the level, the rate at which people take pro- to, to prosecutions are uh, much lower. And I think that pe- women will be, uh, and men who've been victims of rape, will be really offended by what you're saying here. Because There's, actually, the no. courts are there to decide that. The legal system is there to decide that. Uh, uh, no, but George, George Galloway, I'll, I'll let you in again if we have time. George Galloway. Uh, well, uh, Nigel was always a celebrity to me. Uh, and to his uh, loyal constituents. Uh, But you wouldn't describe him as a national celebrity, but his life was very gravely damaged. His political career was very gravely damaged by absolutely false allegations made against him by people who remain entirely anonymous. And that can't be fair. Now, I don't support dealing with... (coughs) Excuse me, dealing with the question removing anonymity from victims. But there must be an argument for extending anonymity to the accused. There must be. After all the cases that we've been through, of which Nigel's is the most uh, close and pressing here on this platform, uh, it cannot be right that Nigel was treated in such a way. Now, Roshanara is correct. There are other issues in this field, one of which is why victims of rape are so reluctant to come forward with it? Is it because of the way the police treat them when they come forward, the way the justice system treats them uh, in the adversarial atmosphere of a courtroom? Why are there so few convictions, so few prosecutions? 
These are all vital issues. So I agree with Nigel that the Select Committee should look at the whole gamut of uh, uh, the sex offences and the way that both victims and the accused are treated. Just so, Roshanara, just one more thought on this. Do you find the argument that you have made about the victims more compelling than the suffering endured by the innocent who is charged and given his life? Well, I, I, I have a sympathy with both um, those who are innocent, who, fi- who are then found, as Nigel was, um, uh, to be innocent, and victims who do need anonymity because this is a very, very complex uh, crime, and if if you remove anonymity, then you're less likely to have people coming forward. So we have to strike a balance, and yeah. that's so, where so the inquiry is. Sorry, not, really if you important. remove if you remove anonymity from the victim, yes, but if you gave anonymity an, anonymity to the uh, alleged perpetrator of the crime, would that not? Uh, uh, also have the impact, as the argument made, that you, less people will come forward. But So my question to you is, given that that may be the case at the moment, do you think that the suffering endured by the Nigels of this world nonetheless um, it, it should be outweighed? Well, uh, uh, Nigel's got a very important point here, um, which is that, that, that this issue does need to be looked at. But I think we have to uh, absolutely protect the rights and the ability of victims to come, come forward and make sure that we strike a, the Who appropriate Who favours in this, in this... Let me just ask this audience here at the Althorpe Literary Festival. Who, who believes that anonymity should be given to those who are accused of sexual crimes like rape? Would you put your hands up? Who believes they should be given anonymity? Who believes they should not be? Well, if this were the Home Affairs Select Committee, its view would be overwhelmingly sympathetic to what uh, Nigel Evans was saying. And three others as well. Thank all you of you very much. Really um, <laughs> just time to tell you that we're going to be in County Durham next week at Durham School. I hope you can join us there. But from here to our panel, thank you very much to you for having us at the Althorpe Literary Festival. I hope you continue to have a great, successful festival. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed any questions this week. To find out more about the programme or how you can get us to come to your area, then go to the BBC Radio 4 website and search for any questions.